Do you know what year we're in? 2022. Do you know what zodiac year we're in? I have no idea. We're in tiger, specifically the water tiger. Can you guess the last year of the tiger? Uh, 2014? Would it help if I told you that there are only 12 animal years? Yeah, okay, so then that would be 2010. Mm -hmm. It was the year of the gold tiger. That was 2010. So there's different tides. There's, there's gold and there's, then there's five water. elements. <laughs> like, like Last Airbender? Last Airbender has four. Oh, Last Airbender has four. But gold tigers are endangered. And there's only about 30 golden Bengal tigers left in the world. 2010 was also quite a big year for movies. Unthinkable? Wait, wait, wait. 2010 was not a big year for movies. In fact, I remember people saying that 2010 movies were bad, specifically the summer. Well, I have a couple here. Unthinkable, the Toy other Story guys. Three. The, the other guys, Iron Man 2, all of which are connected. They're connect same director or something? What connects them is that the cast included the highest film grossing actor of all time and one of the five richest black actors today, Samuel L. Jackson. Now I have a quick true false trivia game about Samuel L. Jackson. I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna be good at this one. Uh-huh. Okay. True or false? He's never won an Oscar. Oh. Uh mm, true. True. He was nominated in what film? Pulp fiction? Correct. Okay. True or false? Never seen one of his own films. False. Is that true? He 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 like joins a ton of different. No, actors it is false. That. Okay, okay. He, he watches a lot of his own films, and uh, he's been in over two hundred screen credits. Yeah, so. I was gonna say it's almost impossible. He's actually got his favorites. Okay, you're two for two. Third one. True or false? Never read the script to Snakes on a Plane before signing on. Uh, true. That sounds that sounds very true. It's based on a quote that he had in two thousand six. I'm not sure how true it is, but I wrote it down as true. <laughs> Okay, because so, it feels like one of those things that he would say in a post interview to keep people entertained. Well, especially for something like snakes on a plane. Yeah, that's why he said he jumped on because right, he was like, yeah. for anything with that crazy title. <laughs> right. But I think he probably did read it in in reality. Um, true or false? Never asked to be in Black Panther. Uh, true. False. He did ask to be in Black Panther, and they said no. Oh, okay. Why did they ever say? Because it doesn't fit in with the Marvel universe at the time, I guess. In keeping with the tiger theme, though. True or false? He's never beat Tiger Woods at golf. False. So he has beat Tiger Woods yeah, at golf? Yeah, I'm going to go with the yes. In an interview this week, he said he beat Tiger Woods in golf. <laughs> so you got almost every single one right, right? You went four for five? Yeah, I think so. And for that, we get to continue the podcast. All right. <laughs> movies weren't the only big thing in 2010, though. Writer Walter Mosley, who we've talked about on the podcast before, he's a bestseller and consulting producer on Snowfall and wrote the episode that you watched, mm. season four, episode three. He came out with the novel The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray, which you may recognize as the title to the show, the Apple series that you watched. It leads me to my next question. Do tigers like apples? Yeah. I First, mean... they're carnivores, so probably not, but they do eat fruit sometimes to help with their digestion, which I think would be fun to watch. <laughs> there is a picture online of a tiger just feasting in on a watermelon. <laughs> I'd recommend anybody Google that. But it was, do they like apples, though? That's yeah, the question. Yeah, fruit. I think they just chop away mm. whatever. Okay. Walter Mosley wrote Ptolemy Gray based on his own experience with his mother's struggle with dementia. Samuel Jackson, who stars in this, decided to buy the rights to the book when it came out. His mother, his grandfather, his uncle, and his aunt have all had Alzheimer's. Since 2012, he partnered with Alzheimer's Association to raise awareness. He also raised money through Prizio, which I think is like Omaze, where he recited fan-written monologues. I think he did the same thing on like Jimmy Fallon or something, where they like gave him something to recite, and he continually was doing it. It might have been for the same thing. For Alzheimer's? Yeah. Uh-huh. So he bought the rights to Mosley's story, and then he cast himself as the leading role of like a 93-year-old man with dementia. He is, or sorry, 93, I mean 91, was, I think. Yeah. I, he he's 91, and he's 73 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those two years make a difference. All right. You watched the first episode. It was called Reggie. Mm -hmm. The second episode is called Robin. So I assume... I, yeah, you're... I think it's going to go through, like, every family member and their interactions with him. Okay. So it's person-centric. Right. The show's been called a dark fairy tale. I was hoping part of it was true because episode two talks about a shot that should help people with Alzheimer's. They, like, take it and it would help them remember everything that they know for, like, 12 hours. You thought there was a cure for Alzheimer's Well, no, there? but I was hoping that, like, we were on our way there or something. Like, this was based on a true story of So you of can't sorts. tell throughout the first episode and part of the second one that this is supposed to be fiction. 
No, not at all. It's it's played it like it's straight up reality. Okay, they, I know it's gritty. The the strange thing about it is like the first episode I can break down into four parts. And the first part is the very first scene where we see that Potomac Gray, he's like very much there, he's coherent, he's speaking into like a voice recording box, and then he like picks up a gun and then we suddenly see that someone is knocking on the door. But it's completely contradictory to what we see next. Where suddenly, two months earlier, we see that he's in a really messy apartment. It's the same place, but he's not able to remember a thing. Like, he needs to have his a great nephew come, Reggie. And Reggie needs to always, like, take him around town. And we see that he's doing things like wandering into traffic. We see that he's, like, imagining people that aren't there. We're seeing a ton of different things. And that's kind of where part two of the story comes in, where Reggie is just helping him throughout the town. And we also see that there's... So, wait, the first part you're saying is mostly just him what? The first part is just a flash forward. Because everything else... Flash forward? Yes. Because... Not flashback. No, flash forward, because everything else... So all the events that you're seeing in the first scene are stuff from the future. Yeah, it's uh, it's like probably where the finale is going to pick up or but either he's, end. But he's clear-minded. Yeah, he's clear-minded. And that's the part that like made it so, I think, different from other like things that tried to tackle it like this. Yes. Because with something like My Father, which I think was a movie that came out like two years ago. Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins, yeah. You saw that the beginning scene, it's kind of similar where he's coherent, but that takes place in the past. Yeah, and then always. Rest... Because if you have right. Alzheimer's, you would think that all the clarity would right. be from... So, so you can imagine my like shock when suddenly like we're seeing that he's even in a worse place than he was in the past. Got so it. suddenly, you know, Re- so in the second scene, the second part is Reggie. That's where we're really seeing um, Potomac have his memory problems. Like Reggie's telling him, "You need to bolt the door," and he tells him that like right before he's about to leave a couple times. And he's like, "What are you gonna do?" And Potomac's like, "I'm gonna bolt the door." Reggie leaves, and then he doesn't bolt the door. Mm-hmm. You know, like so. There's like these little subtle dramatic things, and it was really working. Like I, I really enjoyed. I think this there was show. a commercial a few years ago about this lady who we watch cooking dinner, and then she walks away from the stove, and she leaves the the oven on or the um like the, the fuse on mm-hmm. so the fire's still yeah, going that's... and then it's like do you see what she forgot or whatever <laughs> alzheimer's effect there, there's also... like yeah so it's the same idea like it's important things that just slip your mind right there's also a commercial that came out i think like a decade ago about someone who had alzheimer's who left their keys in the refrigerator and here potomac does the same thing with an alarm clock he mm-hmm. accidentally leaves his alarm <laughs> clock and just like and whenever you know reggie's asking him why he does this stuff he's always saying answers that don't make any sense so yes. it's obvious that like is he does he play 91 well yeah i thought he played 91 he, he seemed like he was going for an emmy in this show like, it seems like this is definitely something where it's like this show is going to be nominated a lot because it's trying to take such, like, I think a unique idea. Mm-hmm. And obviously you have a big star, like we said, like Samuel L. Jackson playing the but role. But he's not playing it for laughs. He's just no. doing pure drama no. acting. No, this is, this is drama. Yeah, there's not a lot of comedy. Is it a tearjerker? Uh, I would say so. It's very depressing at certain parts. Okay, so second part was him. We see him in his worst state. Yeah. Third part. The third part is after like a couple of days, we see that um he's like running out of beans. Reggie isn't showing up as much. And out of nowhere, kind of Hilliard, who I believe is Reggie's son, shows up and is like, hey, Reggie isn't here. I'm going to be the one that's going to be helping you out today. So that while, where we see the first part is Reggie helping him throughout the day, we now understand that Hilliard, Reggie's son, is going to now be kind of take over that role. And my first thought when I heard that is like, Reggie dead? Like, why isn't Reggie the one that's showing up? But then we see that Hilliard, he, like, seems like a good person at first. Like, there are some... Where Potomac is living is not a great place. There's, like, drug dealers outside. There's people who are on it's drugs. It's a cheap apartment. There's even, like, a woman who continually runs Wait, up is to is it him. a house or an apartment? It's an apartment. Okay. Uh, there's, like, a woman that, in for both episodes, runs up to him and is like, where's my money? Like, I need my money. And is very much in his face. Yeah. And, um, it, like, Hilliard, like, is backing her off and, like, yelling at her. And is like, stay away from my uncle and doing all this type of stuff. But it leads to kind of a turning point in Hilliard's character where Potomac needs to go to the bank to uh, bank his three checks. and His disability uh, checks. Right. But since he doesn't know where... Or Social is, Security, probably. Social Security is pension and then another thing okay. you said. I can't remember. Um, but Hilliard and him are walking and Hilliard thinks that Potomac knows where he's going until suddenly they're like randomly at like one of those He gets frustrated? Yeah, he gets very frustrated. And then the cops show up. And they think that for some reason it was like racial profiling. Hilliard was like annoying Potomac mm-hmm. until Potomac like kind of stands up for Hilliard. But by that point, Hilliard has had it. He sees Potomac in this like very bad state. He's already fed up with having to be racial profiled and kind of having to stick up for him and do all the things that Reggie usually did 
Uh, so when they actually go to the bank, he ends up stealing some of the money that Potomli is cashing. Mm -hmm. Like usually, he says it's, he gets three hundred dollars. So uh, and, and Potomli doesn't realize, it, or he does. He does. Oh, okay. but but like you know, uh, Hilliard is playing it off like he it's didn't do anything like that because they give him three different envelopes, all have a hundred dollars in them. Hilliard steals two of them. It's pretty easy to get what's going on, right? Here, and so and yeah, so Potomli only gets one, and he actually is able to pick it up. Like I said, like he. He's like, you, you're a thief from me. You're doing all this, like, sort of different stuff. And then Hilliard's like, no, 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 you're just acting crazy. And then they end up going to the house, and that's where part four takes place because that's Reggie's funeral. Uh, we, the viewer, understand what's happening way before Ptolemy does. It's almost like you're kind of waiting for the shoe to drop because uh -huh. there's, like, all of Reggie's family are introduced to other characters like Robin, who the second episode is based around. Uh, so it feels like one of those things they might have even told Ptolemy at one time that he just forgot. Right, yeah. Okay. And, uh, Are and, we seeing it through a different lens? Because I heard that certain shots they made right. They do this more blurry. very interesting thing with back flashes where like the bottom of the screen is completely blurred. Yeah. So it's they like, had, like that. a piece of broken glass obstructing the view almost. Yeah. That and, they and I thought that that, that was help? a cool way to do it. Yeah. Cinematography. Um, I will say that like in terms of the back flashes, whenever they happened, it seemed a little unnecessary uh, because I was more interested in just what was going on in with the like, Potomi, yeah, and in the present. And it also was just kind of like, there's this character Cordell, I believe that was Potomi's dad, who as a character who he like envisions in different separate scenes, I felt didn't really add much to the story because he's always just kind of mean. So how does part four end then? Part four ends and Potomi realizes that Reggie's dead and he's able to actually, it was almost like, remember making a murder when the main uh, person, Brandon, was like able to tell the judge that was the that was the other one right yeah well he was he's not stephen avery he's the no, second yeah yeah and he was able to tell the judge that he didn't feel like his lawyer was like a good lawyer mm -hmm. that is almost what happens kind of here where potomi is actually able to be like i want robin to take me home because i don't trust hilliard and he even is able to tell hilliard's mother like hey he stole from me but he's not able to do it in a way that makes sense yes so the point is, is that robin and um him Go on the bus. She's taking him home. So he has to thread the needle. Samuel L. Jackson has to play that line where it's like, I have to come off where the audience understand what's going on, but that they believe right. that the other characters wouldn't understand what was yeah, going on. Yeah, and, and he does a really good job at it. And then um, they're on the bus, and Ptolemy's like, I'm going to figure out what happened to Reggie. Um, and then that's where the first episode So you don't ends. know. You, that's still a mystery to you. Right. For in the, in the flash-forward an... scene, it even makes less sense because you're like, well, how did it get from there to you know him actually making sense? Uh, and Robin's the one who's taking him home. So you meet her at the very end right, of this episode yeah. as well. For an episode that's called Reggie, it doesn't sound like he was in it well, all that much. Well, I would say, like, the parts are kind of, uh, like, within 20 minutes of each other. So, like, when we first meet Reggie, that's, like, a 20-minute thing. That Interval happens. of him just right. helping out yeah. and just kind of better like call, bring, better bring call in, solving it. Bringing him to the doctor. Yeah, you know, great right. nephew, but yeah. So that first episode was directed by Raymond Barani, most recently known for his work in the 2021 film The White Tiger, about a man from a poor Indian village who tries to escape poverty. Barani's adapted screenplay was actually nominated for an Oscar, so it was also based off a book. Oh, okay. And that book came out, guess when? 2010? No, 2008, <laughs> the same year as The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Yeah, okay. The genre yeah. is so similar to that movie that it was the first thing I connected it with. The titles could actually be switched, if you think about it. The Last Days of Benjamin Button makes sense <laughs> and so does the curious case of Ptolemy gray because <laughs> yeah. he's working on a case right yep okay um you've also been reading some of the blacklist movies lately right uh yeah blacklist scripts that came out in 2020 the unproduced ones mm -hmm. one of those blacklist scripts not for this year but from a previous year was reminiscence and mm. the plot of this sounds a lot like that panned movie yeah. and the other thing that it reminded me of was true detective season three because Mahershala Ali was brought in to play an elder detective with dementia trying to solve a case about two missing children 35 years before. He was trying beforehand. to solve a case and he had Alzheimer's? Well, no. They had interview like uh, detectives who came in to interview him who was on the force 35 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And he had dementia then. And so we kept on seeing backlashes of him earlier and then having it juxtaposed mm -hmm. with now. That was, yeah, that was basically what they did with the backflashes here. Except the backflashes took, like, I'd say, like a minute to two minutes. They didn't take up a lot of the plot. Yeah. And it was a different case, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it was an unre unreliable narrator, which we've also seen in things like the uh, woman in the house across, across the street, street from the place on the end mm -hmm. wall. Um, and then so episode two, though is where we get more information on this murder, I assume? 
Uh, yeah, we actually understand where the, like, kind of, we, we get the seeds as to what the flash forward was all about. I really like the first 20 minutes of this, uh, because it was a lot more lighthearted than the first episode was. Robin, she's living with, um, Hilliard's yeah, mom. Yeah, so Robin is supposed to be a teenager, right? Mm-hmm. Dominique Fishback, who plays 17-year-old mm-hmm. Robin, is 30 years old. Really? Yes. You, She's you, from the Deuce <laughs> and Judas and the Black Messiah. 30 years old. Yeah, I mm-hmm. didn't. Yeah, I would never have guessed that. Okay, so she does play a teenager well. Right, yeah. Uh, she's kicked out of uh, Hilliard's mom's home because Hilliard tried to, like, sleep with her when she was sleeping. It, it was it was kind of dark in the first scene, but that's when she decides to go over to Potomac Gray's apartment. And uh, in the first 20 minutes or so, it's kind of therapeutic because, again, you see, you see, like, his completely messy apartment, and she decides to start helping him, like, clean it out and everything. Mm-hmm. And there are things here and there uh, where Potomac Gray is, like, kind of confused. But I thought that in the second episode... He's a, he was able to remember a lot more and, like, kind of put two and two together better even before he's given the shot that's supposed to help his Alzheimer's in episode two than episode one. Like in episode That's pretty one, accurate, though, because, A, people have their good and bad days when they have dementia, yeah. but also because when they have interaction continuously, it's better for their brain than if they're just sitting there for most of the and, time and, I was, and then waiting for someone to pick them up. I was thinking also that it was just kind of showing that, like, when, when he was getting, like, his apartment cleaned, it was also just putting him in, like, a better headspace just in general anyways. Mm-hmm. So, like, that's that's the thing. You see 20 minutes, and it's like she's cleaning up the bathroom. She's really, like, throwing stuff out that he doesn't want to. Um, he was keeping things that he didn't need at all, like, in the first uh, He's a episode. hoarder. Yeah, ho- straight up hoarder. Th- this is all because Walter Mosley, again, had that direct co- uh, connection with his mother and yeah. like everybody who's ever been a family member or had a family member who's been diagnosed with dementia knows what this type of thing is going so they're trying to keep that accurate and so now i can understand why you were thinking this was less fiction and more just real life uh documentation of how like life is right in fact the only time that like i ever was like huh is when um by the very end of the episode we meet walton goggins who i don't even think was credited in the first episode like i don't even think dr said rubin the, yeah dr walton rubin goggins. Who, who now was he hateful in this episode no but that's was what, he one of eight people? i was yeah <laughs> No, but I was thinking, I was like, where's the connection between Samuel L. Jackson and Walton Goggins? Because I was thinking, well, Quentin Tarantino, you had Timothy Oliphant in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and then like, but no, then I was like, yeah, it's Hateful Eight. Yes. Have um, you ever seen Walton Goggins' Wikipedia photo? Yeah, it like has a cowboy it's hat, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Again, I recommend people to go look that up. Uh, two shows that he's done recently the that Unicorn. we did. Oh, that we did? Righteous Gemstones. Mm-hmm. And can you think of the other one? No. Invincible. Oh, yeah. But course. obviously, he's yeah, from yeah. Justified, the uni- Unicorn, and uh, uh, sh- Shield. <laughs> but the Unicorn, Omar Benson Miller, who played Reggie, oh, okay. was actually in the Unicorn as well. He all right. One of the so, cast members yeah. So it's all like interconnected. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, Dr. Rubin comes in there and is basically uh, telling both of them, but really speaking more to Robin because she's the one that understands that, like, yeah, there's a shot. The effects are only going to work for 12 hours, but he should be, like, sharp as a tack. Sorry, how does he get there like he just shows up at the door one day they, like no, a traveling they, salesman no, or they call him there's someone who's reggie's friend who we meet in the first episode mm-hmm. and uh reggie even writes down a note that says like on march 27th we need to go to the doctor yeah um so that's how they figure out that they need to go but they just get a ride from reggie's friend so this is like a magical neurologist who is capable right. of curing or changing his out so he, he tells them that from the beginning he's like i have a drug here that will fix everything. Well, there's there's a couple of caveats to it. Yeah. One, he mentions some side effects that I'm not sure we ever really learn about. Yet. Yeah, yeah yet. And then also, like, the shot is only going to work the best the first time, and it's only going to work for 12 hours. Oh, interesting. So it doesn't work for... So last days of Ptolemy Gray. I get it now. <laughs> right. That also makes sense with what Walter Mosley was saying, which is, like, what if you could have your family member back for because that's the only thing you ever want right. it's the same person you're looking at this their same voice but they don't have it they don't have those memories right? right so like what if you could have that back what would you pay for that what would you give and uh just for a little while and it connects back to again to the first scene where it's like we see him more coherent we understand why his apartment isn't like a mess and how why it's organized so that kind of also it's like a normal drug addict where it's like the first dose of heroin is going to be super the best feeling ever the best right, feeling of right, your life and yeah. then after that it's just going to wean off a little well bit every, every single every single time they give him a shot because they do give him two shots i'll two get to shots. that in a second but they give him the first shot 
uh, uh, he, he's like always like out, but we do see Potomac Gray, like he's able to understand things. He remembers Robin's name, which is something he hasn't been able to do for like the first two episodes. Yeah. He's remembering like giving gifts and everything. Uh, the only part that I didn't really understand in this episode is that when the effects are starting to give off, I think it's like the 12 hours have passed. Robin they is- They start to wane. Yeah, they start to wane. Robin is telling him like, we need to go back to Dr. Rubin because uh, Dr. Rubin was talking about how you need to make a decision and you're only going to understand that decision when you're on the drug because it's a big decision. Again, I'm not sure if we're ever told what it is. And then he's like, no, no, I, I don't need to do that. And then she's like, well, why not? And he's like, it's not going to make a difference. And I was like, well, it obviously is going to make a difference. It didn't really make much sense why Samuel Jackson was going to say. Are they already that. investigating, though, the murder or finding anything suspicious about it? They do go, actually, yeah, that, that was when he was on, after he's given the shot, he after goes to where Reggie was uh, was shot down. Mm -hmm. And he actually speaks to a couple homeless people, one of the people who saw them. And they were like, yeah, there was this black dude with uh, spiky hair. And he ended up gunning down a different person. But that's all that we get at, at that point. And um, so it looks like they're going to continue that investigation or not? Uh, it looks like they're going to continue it. Okay. It, it is the underlying... Like, Did you like episode two more than episode I one? I liked episode one more than episode two. All right. Uh, I'll get to the very end of episode two. So oh, okay. the so the shot completely wears off, yes. like 100%, and, uh, and he starts freaking out. And the doctor, not Dr. Rubin, but the person who was there with him administering the shot... Uh, Robin calls and ro and like they run in and then they give him the second shot. Now this made me confused because I thought that they said that the only time the shot was going to work was going to be the first shot. Well, work as well. Uh, yeah. And and so it, by the end of the episode, yeah, they give him the second shot and he again was freaking out, kind of like imagining Cordell and his wife, which he's doing throughout the first two episodes, and that's where it ends. His wife who passed away already. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. The second episode was directed by Debbie Allen. Um, she is best known for starring in the 80s musical series Fame. Um, she was also born in 1950, the year of the tiger. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Again, gold. Uh, the show has a 7.1 on IMDb. I think it deserves higher. That, that makes me a little but, sad. That's a little, yeah. But the user reviews are very enthusiastic. Median of a 10, nothing below a 7, and 85% on Rotten Tomatoes with a consensus. Mm -hmm. Variety, New York Times, Roger Ebert, The Guardian all highlighted how good the Jackson Fishback Rapport was. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And there are six episodes, two of which are released, one that comes out tomorrow. Uh, nothing really negative to these first two episodes at all. I thought, I yeah, I thought that the, the first episode I just really enjoyed, I think, more because you really just, again, Samuel Jackson does a good job. And he does his best when you're able to understand when you're able to understand what he's saying, but he's not able to, like, uh, do it I correctly. read it that, like, he was turning more into Samuel L. Jackson every time he got a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, he, cause, like, you, you, you just want him to become Samuel you L. Jackson. See him, yeah, you see him disheveled <laughs> when he's not, you know, when he doesn't have the shot, but when he does, he, like, has better air, and he's, like, acting like Okay, so it's, like, a clearer focus. It seems like he's more... Right. Present. Like, like in the second episode, his eyes are less glazed over. Right, like in the second episode, so. you see that if, through his POV, he has like tunnel vision, and you can't imagine him having tunnel vision when you see him on the shot because he just seems more coherent. Mm -hmm. So, for someone who just watched the show, what do you think that they'd be left with? Uh, that's really tough to watch. Like they make a, they do a good job of making situations awkward. Like, like I said, there are times where like sad Potomac and Gray, awkward. Sad and awkward. He's like Potomac Gray is almost walking into traffic. It doesn't sound like there's any real comedy in there at all, except no. for maybe Walton Goggins. I mean, like there's there's a couple things here and there. Like he he's not able to read social cues either. Like a, someone with Alzheimer's, like he's like almost screaming or yelling like in a restaurant, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, and yeah, I thought that they were they captured it very well. I think like people some people who actually have to deal with this. The only negatives I have about it is that like there are some points where it's a little melodramatic. Mm. Um, you know, certain things. Reggie predictable. Dying. Predictable, and in some cases, Reggie dying was definitely like one of those emotional scenes. But it's also like they play it off there there are some things that happen like at the funeral home uh where like robin is not treating potomac gray really it's the first time that they're interacting uh, with each other with like any respect and i'm like i'm not sure if that would really actually happen in that case um also the second episode seems a lot less concentrated in the first episode everything seems like kind of tightly wound like uh you understand there's more going on yeah and, and then in the second episode it's like okay well now they're cleaning the apartment now they're going to the doctor's office now he's on the shot now he's like trying to figure out what happened to his it, it seems a little bit all over the place but except for those two things i thought that the show did a really good job of making a depressing but uh compelling case in this so last minute rating would be overall with the two episodes combined i'd give it an eight an eight out of ten yeah 
All right. Maybe eight and a half. Anything else you want to say about it? No, that's about it. Well, I do have one last thing to say. I say four Bengal tigers were rescued from a traveling circus and released in South Africa two days ago. <laughs> Did you just look up like random facts about tigers? Random facts. These were all connected <laughs> to this show. And we just did a show that was like Tiger King, and we didn't even mention any of this stuff. So I felt like we had to get it in there. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll see you on the next one. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye.